Last week I put out a video talking about five bands that hadn't put out a bad record. And while I was doing this, I kept running into bands and I'm like, ooh, that's a great band. Oh, but they have that one record or sometimes it's two records that really put a blemish on their discography. So today, let's talk about it. Let's talk about five, actually, Let's talk about 10. Let's double it. We're going to talk about 10 great prog bands. We're talking about like the cream of the crop in terms of progressive rock like legends that just put out terrible records. These are albums that are like a 2 out of 10 or lower. We're talking about terrible records here. That's all the lead up we need. Let's just dive right in. First up, I'm wearing their shirt. Rush, one of my favorite bands. Even Rush has put out some really bad records. And I want to talk about two. And I'm not even going to talk about Caressa Steel. Because at the end of the day, I still think Caressa Steel is a good record. Uh, there's some blemishes. You know, there's some boils on there. But at the end of the day, I would still consider it a good record. I would say that that's about like a 6 out of 10. These are records that are 2 out of 10s. And we're talking about the 1-2 punch of counterpoints and hold your fire. The late 80s, early 90s were not kind to Rush, you know? I have learned to accept their new wave electronic era. And I would still say that those records are like about a 5 out of 10, 6 out of 10. I would even say that Power Windows is a good like 7 out of 10. But it's with Counterpoints and Hold Your Fire that they just... They wanted to get back into rock, but they didn't know how to let go of the electronic stuff. And... They didn't know what rock music was if you weren't a hair metal band or if you weren't quite a proto-grunge band, what to do with that. And so they were floundering. They they were treading water. Now, I will go to bat for band, like albums like Presto, Roll the Bones, and Test for Echo. I still think those three records are still really, really good. They all three of them have something really fun to offer. But Hold Your Fire and Counterpoints don't have any of that. Like at least Test for Echo and Roll the Bones have the title tracks on there. And Presto is a fun record at the end of the day. Can't say the same about Counterpoints and Hold Your Fire. Uh, yeah, both of those tr albums are stinkers. You know, those are about a two out of five, uh, two out of 10 for me, one out of five. So yeah, unfortunately Rush has that blemish on there. Let's go to my favorite band of all time. My favorite band of all time. This was what got me into progressive rock music. We're talking about Genesis. We're talking about the album Abacab. Can't stand this record. No matter how many times I try to go into this record, I cannot get it. Even people are like, oh, but it's got me and Sarah Jane. I'm like, great. A 5 out of 10 song is not enough to lift this blech out of the muck. Every time I listen to it, I just feel as if they were experimenting and it went wrong. There's almost a part of me that's like almost proud of them for going this bad you know like at least with duke they still held on to a shred of dignity and you know they were flirting with pop music and progressive rock and they did both very very well with turn it on again and misunderstanding being pop anthems at the time but you still had those prog epics of the duke's travel and duke's end and that whole first half of the first side of the album with duchess so they were able to hold both sides of the the equation very very well then when they got into abacab they're like well screw that we're not going to have you know a single on here outside of maybe the title track that sounds terrible and we're not even going to do anything prog on here so yeah abacab just a stinker the most it gets is maybe a one and a half out of ten maybe but yeah, there's nothing on here to write home about outside of it being terrible. Okay, let's go to something a little bit more contemporary. We're going to talk about a more modern band. We're going to talk about the Flower Kings. Flower Kings, one of the forefathers for the retro prog. You know, in the 90s where prog was dead, essentially, you had these guys from Sweden holding up the prog banner very proudly. For most of their discography, they were putting out at least 7 out of 10, 8 out of 10, 10 out of 10 records. And then they took a little bit of a break. They took a little bit of a hiatus. And when they came back, it has just been snoozeville. It feels like The Simpsons after about season 13. And it's just why, you know? And so we're talking about Waiting for Miracles is the poster child for this. The first one that they put out after the hiatus. And I was just flabbergasted with the music that they were putting on. It was sloppy. 
it was all over the place. And I just, I didn't know what they were doing. I was just like, this is bad, you guys. Uh, now, they put out Islands, which I, I kind of like, you know, and maybe it's just the the juxtaposition after Waiting for Miracles. Anything after Waiting for Miracles was going to be good. But after that, we had By Royal Decree and Look at You Now. And both of them are just like, what are you guys doing? You're barely treading water in that case. So yeah, you know, they're definitely going out with a whimper rather than the bang that was the one-two punch of Banks of Eden and Desolation Rose. So a little bit sad on that one. Okay, let's go back to a legacy band. Let's go back to Pink Floyd. Now, Pink Floyd has a handful of not so great records, but I'm an odd duck. I'm an odd duck. Some of those not so great records I actually really enjoy. Uh, their early stuff, Piper at the Gates of Dawn, Saucerful Secrets, still love. I honestly like Amagama, so it's not Amagama. Uh, you know, all of David Gilmore's stuff on there is really, really good. And I even love some of their later stuff. Division Bell is one of my favorite records of all time. And A Momentary Lapse of Reason, I still look back on very fondly. There's still some moments on there that I really love. The album I'm talking about is The Final Cut. I have a very spotty history with The Final Cut. I went from being indifferent to it, to genuinely enjoying it, to now actively avoiding it. <laughs> you know, it's just so boring. Like, okay, this if this was a Roger Waters record, I might enjoy it a little bit more because that's essentially what it is. Richard has left the band. Rick was just like, cool guys. I'm out. It really suffers from that, you know, at least with The Wall, where Rick still had a little bit of a hand, like maybe a finger on the steering wheel, providing a little bit of identity on it. But the final cut, he's gone, and you definitely feel his absence. It's bland, it's very depressing, the subject matter on it isn't all that great. I can appreciate this record from a production side of things. The production on this record is top notch. How they're using the 3D effects of the kind of the headphones of the, you know, the stereo is outstanding. Listening to this record with a good pair of headphones is a trip. I just wish that the music that they're doing on it sounded a little bit better. This album is a very good, like a very solid two out of 10 for me. Um, yeah, it's, it's a stinker. It's a bit of a stinker. Uh, okay, we're going to go back to a contemporary. We're going to go back to a, a legend within the progressive rock movement who has distanced himself from progressive rock only to not necessarily embrace it, but definitely play in its sandbox to one that once again kind of pushes against it. And we're talking about Stephen Wilson. I'm going to leave Porcupine Tree at the side because at the end of the day, I don't think the Porcupine Tree band has put out a terrible record. Whereas the Steven Wilson solo project has one that I would call a terrible record. And that this might be a controversial opinion because I know some people love it, but I know a lot of people don't. We're talking about To The Bone, the follow-up from his two records that are, well, I would actually include three, three records that are like staples of modern progressive rock, starting with Grace for Drowning, going into The Raven That Refused to Sing, and then finally ending it off with Hand Cannot Erase. These are three standard modern progressive rock albums. They're masterpieces. All three of them are masterpieces. Then he follows it up with To the Bone. And To the Bone was him trying to distance himself from that. And he succeeded because it's not a good record. There are moments on here that have glimmers of light, and that makes this record even more frustrating because I'm like, there are moments on here that you could have expanded upon. You could have done something really interesting and really fun with, but instead you don't know how to blend your melancholical, nihilistic, moody, atmospheric music with a pop landscape. You know, you were trying to do the whole new wave shoegaze type of a music from the 80s that the Smiths or Tears for Fears, but in a modern sense, and it just didn't quite work for me. You know, it, it just, it fell very, very flat. Now he has subsequently improved upon this with the two albums that came afterwards of uh, the Future Bites and the Harmony Codex, where he's starting to perfect that, he stopped trying to write a pop record. And I think 
when he was trying to write a pop record, it failed. But when he tries to write a contemporary singer songwriter with catchy moments, that's where he succeeds. And I feel that's where he succeeded with the Harmony Codex. So yeah, to the bone, terrible record. Let's move on to another big, big progressive metal band. Probably the biggest progressive metal band. We're going to Dream Theater. And there's a couple records on here that you could say are terrible, but I'm not going to be talking about The Astonishing. I still have a soft spot for The Astonishing. I'm not even going to be talking about their first record. Again, there's a couple songs on there that are really, really good. I'm talking about a terrible record. We're going with their self-titled work. Oh boy. Um, outside of, you know, the Illumination uh, Theory, I think, the big 20-minute one, and a couple of the tracks from the very beginning, like I think it's The Enemy Within, or The Enemy Inside, that is where the praises stop. And both of those tracks, they have done better on other records. They've done better epics, and they've done better singles. It's all those bloody ballads and all those really boring moments. Like, these are the moments that I can see why people aren't a big fan of Octavarium, because Octavarium was doing that as well, and Octavarium is one of my favorite, if not my favorite, Dream Theater records. And on those records, there was heart, there was soul, there was a message, there was meaning behind those somber, ballady, introspective tracks. On here, it just feels flat and it just feels wasted and I cannot get myself into it. So yeah, terrible record. I don't want to spend too much more time on that because I've already, I've already talked at length about how I'm not a big fan of that record. Let's talk about some of those legacy bands. Let's talk about those bands that got really big back in the 70s. We're talking about Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. I gotta admit, the two albums they put out in the 90s, Black Moon and the one that we are actually talking about, we're actually talking about In the Hot Seat, they're just not good. Like, at least with Black Moon, there's something on here that I can grab onto. You know, Black Moon, uh, The Romeo and Juliet, The Burning Bridges, and foot to, Footsteps in the Snow. It's listenable. It's listenable. I would say that this is a 4 out of 10. So it doesn't quite meet the threshold of the 2 out of 10. It's in the hot seat that I was just like, what on earth are you doing, my guys? Uh, not only are you doing a... Um, now, I know it's a bonus track, but you're essentially repurposing the pictures at an exhibition to kind of fill space. But yeah, this guy, this guy doesn't have anything on here that I would come back to. You know, uh, the man in the long black coat being a Bob Dylan track is just bleh. Uh, Daddy, change, give me a reason to stay. Ugh, they're all just, it's all just a dud. Honestly, they should have stopped with Emerson, Lincoln, Powell, and they would have had a brilliant, brilliant discography. I would even say Love Beach has its moments, but honestly, it's in the hot seat that is just the hot garbage. You know, that's the one that has like the one out of 10 for me, so... Yeah, do not, do not approach. Do not, do not even try it. Okay, let's get on to another one. Let's go to Gentle Giant. Now, I know a lot of people think that Gentle Giant has a solid discography. Nathan is completely in the right by saying that Gentle Giant doesn't have a bad record. I want to push back only a little bit because in my mind, and it's not even Giant for a Day. It's not even Giant for a Day. At least with Giant for a Day, again, Nathan is right. The Spooky Boogie uh, and a couple other tracks off of that, it's really fun. It's a fun record. Can't say the same about The Missing Piece, though. The Missing Piece does not have any redeemable qualities to it. It is just a snooze fest from start to finish. I don't know what they were thinking with this record. At least with Interview, which was a little bit of them wavering, a little bit of them treading water. It was like their, their warning call of where the missing piece is going. Uh, and I just, I don't know, everything that I loved about the band, the quirkiness, the avant-garde stylings, is just uh, thrown out the window. And I, every time I listen to it, I always wonder why I try. Because there's nothing in this record that I really appreciate and I really like. That is a 2 out of 10 record for me. Can't do it. All right, let's talk about some Neo Prog. I'm trying my best to talk more about Neo Prog because I feel like Neo Prog isn't talked about all that often and I want more people to love Neo Prog. We're going to talk about my favorite Neo Prog group, 
and their foray into a little bit more of pop music that didn't end well. Uh, after putting out uh, their first two records, like banger after banger, we're talking about IQ. IQ put out Tales from the Lush Attic and The Wake in 1983 and 1985, and both of them, brilliant neo-prog stuff. I absolutely loved it. And they tried to do a little bit more of the kind of pop stuff, and we're talking about uh, Gnome Zamo, their uh, 1987 release, and the only record of theirs that I own, which is really saying something, uh, and Are You Sitting Comfortably, their 1989 release. At least with 1989's release of Are You Sitting Comfortably, they started to dip their toes a little bit more into the prog sphere with Falling Apart at the Seams and Wernish. Were uh, but even this was not enough to entice me, you know, it wasn't enough to bring me back. And, uh, Nam Zamo was just a dud. Holy jeez. I was listening to this record the other day and I'm like, what were they thinking? This is a completely different band. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't know what they're doing on this record. It sounds bad. Um, uh, and coming from a band that I absolutely adore. Now, luckily... They followed up Are You Sitting Comfortably. They took a little bit of time off and returned with Ever in 93, and it put them right back onto the stage. Ever is just a staple of progressive, like neo-progressive music, and I'm so glad that they kind of went back to their roots, back to the good stuff, and it's it's an absolute joy. So, yeah, Nimzamo and Are You Sitting Comfortably, avoid like the plague. This brings us to the last one. This brings us to the last one. And it feels like they've been hovering over my shoulder the entire time I've been talking about them. We're talking about Yes. And in Yes, they had a moment where they really dipped in quality, where there was questions whether or not they wanted to continue. They were starting to create a whole new band and they wanted to continue as a whole new band, but there was enough members of the original band that they're like, why don't we just call it a Yes album? And even those records, you know, Big Generator and 90125, I still, there's a part of me that kind of likes those. You know, it's a very small part of me, very small. Uh, but even with those records, I would say that those are like four, maybe three out of five. You know, we're not coming back to the threshold of the two out of five. That is where you have open your eyes. This abomination from the 90s is just, huh, I don't know what they were thinking about this one. I cannot, I honestly can't get through this record. It's too long. It's too wavering. They didn't know if they wanted to go back into prog or if they wanted to go back into pop. They didn't know what they wanted to do and they tried to do both at the same time and it didn't quite work. At least it follows it up with talk, which I actually enjoy. They have, you know, after that, they went into the late 90s with the ladder and magnification, which are beautiful records, absolutely astounding records. And uh, then they came back with Heaven and Earth, an absolute stinker. One of the worst records I've ever heard. Heaven and Earth and Open Your Eyes. These are the two big stinkers from one of my all-time favorite bands. And it, what frustrates me the most, what frustrates me the most with Yes, is that I know that they're better than this. I know that they're better than this because they have put out records before and after these ones that are legitimately good. Like, Heaven and Earth was followed up by The Quest and Mirror to the Sky. They're both, meh. like, Mirror to the Sky is actually, a, I would consider a good record. I would say that Mirror to the Sky is like a 6 out of 10. The Quest is hovering about a 4.5 out of 10. You know, like, it's, it's fine. But I, again, I know that they're better than this, and they proved it with Mirror to the Sky. Same with Open Your Eyes. I know that it's better because they did talk just a few years before and they did ladder a few years after. So that is what's so frustrating about these two records. They have proven that they're better than this. They're better than this. And yet they decide to put out duds like that. So that is where I'm going to leave you on. Those are 10 great prog bands with terrible records. What are some records that you just cannot listen to from some of your favorite bands. Let me know all about that by commenting down below. Also, let me know how I'm right, how I'm wrong, how my opinions and ideas differ than yours. Once again, comment section there. Just use it. Have fun. And that's where I'm going to leave it. That's where I'm going to leave it. I want to thank all of you so much for watching. As always, you guys are definitely the best. And until next time, notes out.